All right, folks, moving into chapter 21, and we're looking at Renaissance and what's called the uh, Quattrocento Italy, which is dated from 1400 CE to 1500 CE. All right, so it's the uh, 14th century, and the, or I'm sorry, the 15th century. Um, so with that, you know, you have a century that's always one number higher than the range of the time. So the range of time is going to be from 1400 to 50 or 1400 to 1499 technically and then we call that the 15th century once we <clears throat> have moved past the zero mark from the first century a uh, first century CE to the first uh, century CE okay so, Anyway, Renaissance, so we're talking about the Renaissance. Uh, we mentioned or we discussed the early Renaissance, the proto-Renaissance elements in chapter 20. And now we're going to really start getting into the uh, bulk of it all. And we're going to start discussing uh, very important individuals that you may have heard of, um, such as Donatello um, in this regard, and then also talking about an individual by the name of Masaccio, which will be very influential to the high to late Renaissance artists uh, such as Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo, as well as Raphael. Okay, so those four main Renaissance artists um, have a very prominent uh, place, not only in this time, but throughout the artistry all the way up to today, plus even in pop culture, as some of you may know, in regards to uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and how all those characters in pop culture have been named after these Renaissance artists. And that's where the names have come from. All right. So what's happening during this time from 1400 to around 1499 um, there are three main areas we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Florence in particular, because that's going to be the epicenter of activity. And then we're also going to talk about uh, Venice and then uh, Mantua. Okay, and these are three main areas of activity during this kind of early Renaissance period. Um, and more than early, we're actually getting into the the onset of it, okay, kind of like the um, neophyte or infantile like um, time frame, okay. And what's occurring here is um, we're going to have again, or we're going to have an increase of humanism, all right. And that increase of humanism is associated with an increase in education and an increase in literacy. And I mentioned that in the last video. And there's going to be writers during this time, for example, Dante Allegri, who are going to create a new type of literary vernacular where it's not going to be necessarily based in Latin or old Latin language, which was very, has been very common. It's now going to be a new type of dialect, or not dialect, a new type of vocabulary, a new type of what's called a vernacular. And with this new type of vernacular, it's 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 directly uh, connected with the increase of literacy and education at this time. And as education is on the rise, not just in higher class or echelons of individuals, but across the board, there's going to be an interest in the old Greek Roman uh, stories and text and and figures during those times, so such as. Plato and Aristotle and the writings that they have done and all of those stories are going to start to find their way back into this level of humanism during this renaissance. And again, renaissance means a rebirth in antiquity. That antiquity is derived from Greco-Roman, which is Greek and Roman. So anything that the Greeks and the Romans did hundreds of thousands of years ago um, is being reborn, all right? It's called a rebirth of antiquity. And again, Renaissance is spelled R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E, all right? So we have that increase in education. We're going to have that interest in the classical text. And when I say classical, again, we're talking about texts that were written during the Greek 
the 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 height of classical Greece and the height of classical Rome. All right. And also, at this time, there's a huge influence in the mercantile prosperity. So maritime and trade and all of that is on uh, is on the on the rise. And um, also, new sciences are starting to develop. You know, you were looking at an interest in geology. We're looking at an interest in botany. We're looking at an interest in anything that is empirically observed. That's a little redundant. Because when something that is empirical, that means you're observing it with your eyes and with tools, instruments, such as scientific tools. So that is on an increase. And there's still, um, everything is very much rooted in, in Christianity and Orthodox Christian themes and ideas. But there's also now a balancing point of new sciences and new levels of observation in the natural world around them, um, geared by humans. And that's why we call this humanism, because this is all being drummed up by leading humanists of this time. Okay. So humanism is really um, an interest in, again, those or orthodox Christian themes coupled with the ancient classical ideas of aesthetics in literature, as well as a new vernacular of, of literary understanding coupled with the increase in education and literacy at this time. And of course, these new sciences with um, new observations, new empirical data, based off of the natural world around them, which we can also call naturalism. Okay, so by looking at the naturalistic world around you, that is naturalism. So humanism and naturalism are going hand in hand. Um, here in Florence, and if you look to start with our PowerPoint, map 21.1 shows you what Renaissance Florence looked like. It breaks down the extent of how prosperous this, these new Renaissance ideas were in this area in Florence. It also shows you significant buildings and different uh, main areas um, that are heavily uh, shrouded, if you will, or heavily populated is a better word, with sculpture. Um, so look to this map and kind of get an idea of how prominent and how um, uh, composited this information is in this area of Florence, Italy in particular during this uh, Renaissance in the uh, Quattrocento Italy. And in Florence what's happening is we have a very rich merchants and uh, bankers, okay? And this is a time, uh, and what this is going to do with these very rich merchants and bankers is it's going to create an interest in competition artistic competition. And what's going to happen at this point is we're going to see competitions between two different artists. Sometimes those artists don't know each other. Sometimes those artists um, are student and master. Uh, sometimes those artists are uh, family members. And sometimes when we saw this in the last chapter uh, with the Lindbergh brothers is collaborations as well. So there's going to be a fond respect for one another through this level of competition. And this competition is rising up because we have three main tiers of commissioners. The first is going to be the papal, which is going to be the pope um, and the papal states. And then we're going to have, again, these uh, merchants or these mercantile class and the bankers, these commerce class. And these three are going to have so much money that they're going to be creating these competitions between the artists. Um, yeah, so that's really kind of what's happening here in Florence in particular. And uh, one more thing I do want to mention, and we're, and we're going to break it down into three areas in Florence. We're going to break it up into sculpture, we're going to break it up into paintings, and then we're going to break it up into architecture. And then after that, we'll get into the Venice section, all right? So Florence is going to be pretty long. You might see a couple video videos in just, in just in regards to Florence. So with the sculptures, what the sculptures are going to show, and the first one we're going to look at is figure 21.2. Um, the sculptures are going to show like an ideal for civil and political liberty. Okay, an ideal of civil and political liberty. 
And what that is meaning is Florence at this time was proving itself to be very wealthy and very successful on its own, within its own level of sovereignty. And it's very much kind of a David versus Goliath situation because there were some exterior influences coming in to try to thwart or try to overtake Florence, but they played this biblical David figure of that sling, and we'll see a we'll see a sculpture by Donatello of David in the sling and throwing this rock and hitting Goliath, who was like a 10, 12 foot tall giant in the middle of the head and uh, defeats Goliath. So a lot of the sculpture that we're going to see is going to reflect these ideals of civil and political liberty, meaning that they can control their own stuff, so to speak. They don't need any big heavy hand doing it for them. And what this is also uh, explaining is the derivative aspect of the Roman uh, Empire. And the Roman Empire governed itself. It didn't need a lot of outside influences. So we're going to start to see a lot of political, uh, civil, and public elements coming from the Roman period. And the aesthetics we're going to see come from the Greek period, as well as some of the Roman verism or the the, the super realism that we saw during the early Roman Empire and the Roman Republic. Um, so that's where that Greco-Roman influence is really starting to take off. Okay, so our first competition is going to be here in figure 21.2. And it's going to be, become, uh, be between uh, master and student. And uh, we have uh, Brunelleschi and uh, Giberti, and it's the sacrifice of Isaac, and, um, and it was a competition. And what's interesting about this is they both did their own version of the sacrifice of Isaac, and you can see figure 21.3 is uh, Giberti, and uh, Brunelleschi is 21.2, all right? And this competition was voted upon. All right. It was voted upon and um, a decision was made from um, from who would win. And uh, Brunelleschi is the one who won. He was the master um, and uh, Giberti was the student. So the master won. Um, but you can start to see and let me break down. Let me give you a couple more things about this uh, to kind of give you a point of differentiation between the two. Um, first. Oh, wait, let me go back. Sorry. The competition, again, is really important in regard to the Greco-Roman discussion that we're having, having because the competition is a voted process like they would do during the Roman Republic, prior to the Roman Empire. So hence that Greco-Roman influence, that, that antiquity influence. They wanted to have this two-thirds kind of vote like the Republic did in Rome, uh, before it became an empire at, at the same time that Greece was also a democratic um, uh, empire and everything was voted upon okay through the city-states so that mentality of voting for things and not just doing an executive order was uh, a big part of these competitions at this time okay I digress a little bit but I wanted to let you know that so with uh, Brunelleschi's the main element of this is going to be very emotional and that emotionality that in that that is that is being emoted in this is coming a lot from that middle mid excuse me that medieval period. And um, if you look at Figure twenty one point three, uh, Gerberti's sacrifice of Isaac, it's going to be more equiposed. It's going to have a little more rationale to it. Um, there's going to be more of a calm disposition with the figures involved. So in 21.3, if you look at Isaac upon the altar, he is almost accepting, looking into his father's eyes, what needs to be done. All right. He's unaffected by it. He accepts it. There's not a lot of angst. There's not, there's not any kind of uh, disposition that proves um, that it that proves a lot of heavy emotion. All right. Versus if you look at 
uh, Brunelleschi's Sacrifice of Isaac, figure 21.2, there's agitation in the body and almost as if uh, Isaac himself is wanting to flee from the scene. And then also the angel is coming in with this force and angst trying to stop Father Abraham from actually um, killing uh, or sacrificing Isaac and letting him know that this was a test from God. So figure 21.2 is going to show you more of this emotional approach, which uh, Brunelleschi being the master is getting from his studies during this late medieval period, which was a very emotional, showing dramatic emotional connections to these biblical stories. But his student, Ghiberti, in Sacrifice of Isaac is starting to move more into the antiquity aspects of the Greco-Roman. So showing more control over your emotions and being more rational to the situation and not blowing up based off of the biblical narrative that's occurring okay and it's there's also other elements like the organic drapery that we see in figure 21.3 which is more true to the organic drapery that we saw during the greek roman periods where it's the body that's influencing the movement of the drapery underneath of it versus figure 21.2 the drapery is more modeled where it looks like it's just placed upon the body of the father who's sacrificing isaac and that in figure 21.2 is a derivative of the medieval modeling and the byzantine modeling of the time prior to the renaissance okay so it's a great to see this competition between student and master but it's also showing us with with uh, brunelleschi's 21.2 where we've come from and then with uh Ghiberti's 21.3 where we're going into the renaissance okay now we get into one of our first turtles uh that's in quotations uh with donatello and uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at figure 21.5. And <clears throat> Donatello, that's D-O-N-A-T-E-L-L-O, -L -L Donatello, um, he learned from his master was Gilberti from figure 21.3. He studied with uh, Gilberti. And... <clears throat> And from those studies and from Gerberti's interest in the Greco-Roman or antiquity and the classical approach to sculpting is going to find its way um, in Donatello's work, okay? And he's going to develop it even more so. And uh, with St. Mark, figure 21.5, um, we're going to start to see the Greco-Roman in St. Mark. So again, when I say Greco-Roman, remember I'm referring to antiquity, and that's what Renaissance is all about. It's Christian Orthodox themes and tales and parables, but relating back to the uh, Greco-Roman aesthetics and styles and architecture and painting and in sculpture. Thematically, what's happening here and how this is Greco-Roman <clears throat> is we have the contraposto. So if you don't recall, or if you didn't to Art History 141, contraposto is a weight shift to the side, and it creates an S-curve throughout the body. And you can see with St. Mark, with the tip of his left foot moving up with the curve of his left leg, then he's shifting his weight over to his right, and then that then it's curving back out towards his left shoulder. Just imagine an implied S curve throughout his body. And then his gaze is pointing back out towards his left. So it creates this sensuous sine wave through his body and creating this directional force with his eyes looking out to the left. That is a Greco-Roman style. Contraposto, spelled C-O-N. T-R-A-P-O-S-T-T-O, -T -T contraposto, okay? That is a symbol of antiquity by developing sculpture in that manner. Um, also, <clears throat> there is an attempt to create more of an arbitrary organic drapery. You can see it in his left leg with his left kneecap pushing outward to control the movement of the fabric, the robe that's placed upon him. 
and that is an example of trying to show that organic drapery versus it looks like a modeled drapery is just placed on him. He doesn't quite have it because if you see over the right leg, it's very modeled. It's very straight. It's very linear. It's very like starchy versus the drapery that's coming over his left leg, it looks more organic, as well as the robe that's hanging down under his left arm, okay? So he's developing this organic drapery from these studies of classical sculptures in, in Greece in particular, and all the way up into the Roman Empire. <clears throat> um, and another thing is, his limbs this is a new concept his limbs are stirring they look like they're moving through this drapery this drapery is deriving this sense of movement and that is kind of separating him from the niche in which he's in in san michelle in florence italy okay on the side of san michelle and it looks like he's been pulled out of that niche he's he's separate from that niche Versus prior to the freestanding sculptures leading up to this time that were part of these niches of these of these cathedrals and of these temples and of these very important architectural buildings, it looked as if they were being hugged in and pushed in and confined and closed off from the niche that's around them, like they're cocooned in it. But here, his limbs are stirring in a way, based off of the way the fabric looks, that makes it seem as if he is stepping out of San Michel. Okay? So that's another big element and another big feature involved. All right. Um, one last thing is his beard and his hair. His beard and his hair and his face is very equal pose, almost has what's called an archaic smile, A-R-C-H-A-I-C, -A -A archaic smile, which means he's unaffected. He's not overwhelmed by emotion. The beard, the clustering and the hair, the beard itself, the clustering is very derivative of the Greeks. And then the hairstyle itself is very derivative of the Romans. Okay. So Greco-Roman influence. So let's see what else Donatello has been influenced uh, in regards to the Greco-Roman. We are going to now move to um, the Feast of Harold, figure 21.8, the Feast of Harold. And we're going to see this as another competition, um, and this time with his master, Giberti. And you can see Isaac and his sons. And we're going to actually do more of a comparison, less of a competition, more of a comparison. And I'm going to kind of break down 21.8 and 21.9. Uh, so with Donatello, Feast of Harold, um, what we're going to see but between these two is, again, we're going to see master and student. And what I want you to look at, again, Donatello is the student. Ghiberti, 21.9, is the master. And I want you to look at the differences with the use of linear perspective, linear perspective. What linear perspective is, is quote unquote, um, rationalization of sight. So what your eyes really see, okay? What your eyes are truly observing. And linear means a linear movement towards a horizon line, okay? It's like if you were, Standing in downtown Yuma and you're looking down the road and it's straight. You can see all the angles of the buildings moving towards the end of the road at the distance where your eye can no longer see. That's linear perspective. Okay. If you're standing at the ocean and you're right on the boardwalk and there's buildings next to you and you can see the ocean at a distance, all of the angles on those lines, a parallel lines are moving towards that horizon line where maybe the sun is setting and where it ends and all those lines converge in an imaginary um, perception is called a vanishing point so let me spell these out l-i-n-e-a-r linear perspective and then where all of the lines and parallel converge it's called a vanishing point vanishing point okay and they would term this linear perspective um, rationalization of sight. So again, just showing you know, this level of rationalism 
through sight. And that goes back to that empirical observation in part of the humanism and the naturalism that I talked about at the beginning of the video. Okay, so we're going to we're going to differentiate that linear perspective and that rationalization of sight. And with um <clears throat> And with that, what we're seeing is using math mathematics to prove this rationalization, using um, architect tools or manners of creating these parallel lines to show things match up and creating different what's called spatial recessions. Okay, linear perspective sets up spatial perspectives. Now, let me explain that. Figure 21.8, Donatello, Feast of Herald, you have a foreground which is the feast itself. And you can see the table is angling back towards the left. That's where the vanishing point is. Then you have a middle ground, which is between the two different archways. And they're arching back at a perspective to the left where the vanishing point is. Then you have a background, another series of barrel arches or arcades, A-R-C-A-D-E, which is a series of barrel arches side by side that are moving back to the back left. Okay, and that is creating through that linear perspective that spatial recession from foreground to middle ground to background. And there's different activities in all three grounds. All right, that's what we call spatial recession. It's also happening, and you can see that the lines are a little off with Gerberti versus Donatello prior to. Gerberti, remember, is coming from the late medieval time slowly learning these new techniques that were originally used with the Greek and the Romans but still weren't fully developed but now these Renaissance artists are starting to develop them and apply them and make them stronger through these new sciences in mathematics and and, and observation and imperial, imperialism um, um, empiricalism and um, naturalism so their techniques of linear perspective are much stronger during this Renaissance time than they actually were in antiquity. But in antiquity, they were trying to develop them. So Gerberti is still coming out of these early Renaissance artists, and uh, Donatello is becoming one of the first famous, established, stylized um, Renaissance artists. The first, the first main sculptor in particular. So you can see in figure 21.9 with Gerberti, the recessional spaces the spatial recessions are there, but you can see that the vanishing point doesn't all line up. You have some vanishing points that are going to the center of the composition, and then you have some vanishing points that are a little obtuse and slightly to the left of the other vanishing point. So the architectural rendering isn't quite there. But with Donatello's, it is. Everything's going back to the left versus here and that was that again is figure 21.8 feast of herald but then Gerberti's Isaac and his sons it, they're not quite lining up but there's still a middle ground a, a, a foreground which is the front a middle ground and then a background but the background is not very active again he's learning uh, from a master that 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 is coming from the middle ages so Gerberti learned from Brunelleschi and then Donatello learned from Gilberti. Okay, so you can see it's slowly progressing. All right, let's see what our time is. I might have to stop here before I get into any more sculptures. Yes, I believe I'm going to have to. Um, let me see. Let me make. Let me just, uh, finish up a few more things. Uh, so we're using a mathematical reason to break this down. Arched courtways to show space, which I just talked about. Arched courtways courtyards and again those arch courtyards are called arcades I just spelled that out for you to show that space which is what's called spatial recession and action in the distance okay because if you look out downtown Yuma you're looking down the road you're gonna see activity in the background you're gonna see people activity in the middle ground you're gonna see activity next to you depend on the time of the year there may be nobody outside you won't see any activity but um, if you're over at the ocean, you're going to see people active around you in the middle ground in front of you directly and then also in the distance up at the ocean. So that's what we're talking about by using these mathematical linear perspective to create this space and also action within the space. 
um, and then they're both learning how to use that vanishing point. You can see Ghiberti in figure 21.9 is not as success successful as what Donatello is doing in Feast of Harold in 21.8. Okay, I'll leave it at that and then we'll start off in the next video. T chapter 21 and 22 are going to be broken up into several videos. So just expect that. It's a lot of information. This is the height of Western art, where everything that we know today in Western art is derived all from this. Um, we'll start with Donatello's David sculpture, and then we'll uh, keep going, and we'll start. Then we'll talk about some paintings and architecture, and then we'll get into Venice and um, Mantua. All right, so we'll be on Florence for a while. All right, see you in the next video.